Thank you. Okay, can you listen to me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, I want to talk to you about uh, complex differential equations. It might seem at, at the first uh, sight like a little bit off subject, but in fact, uh, when you think of the things, the, top, the topics that Bertrand was talking to us about in his course, he talked about Poincaré and the uniformization of Riemann surfaces, and uh, complex differential equations are both a motivation and a tool to study these, uh, these things. I will, I will uh, talk about other sorts of interactions between, or the same probably, between complex differential equations and uh, structures, geometric structures and curves. And the things that interest me uh, are some special features that only some very special differential equations have. So I won't be describing uh, so, sort of, I, I will be far from the generic setting. And I'm interested in knowing, understanding these very, very particular differential equations. OK, so let me begin. So for, for me, a, differential, a complex differential equation will be some complex manifold, M, and some holomorphic vector field, on this manifold. This vector field is given once and for all, so we will be talking, in fact, about auto autonomous complex differential equations. OK, so typically, you have the local theorem that guarantees you. So this is a complex manifold, and this is a complex vector field. So you have locally the, you have your vector field. I will draw it like this, although, OK. So you have an initial condition, and the theorem on the existence and uniqueness of solutions tells you that here, in C, there is some neighborhood of zero and some way to parameterize a small piece of a small disk around your initial condition. And uh, this, will be, this will solve the differential equation, meaning that if you take the vector field, let me put T here, and you push it by this solution of the differential equation, then what you get is just the restriction of your vector field X to the image here. Okay, so that's the local uh, solution. The local theorem on the existence and uniqueness of solutions, it tells you that such a domain exists, such map exists, and that the germ at this point is unique. Okay. So if when you do this, in fact, you can start gluing all the local solutions, and you can start pasting these local solutions. And you will get, when you take this maximal connected sets given by the images of these local solutions, you will get the foliation of your manifold, a foliation by complex one-dimensional leaves. And there's lots of questions you can ask about these leaves. You can when wonder how do they get, up, get messed up in, uh, in, in your ambient manifold. But see, they come from a differential equation, and they are not just, it's not just a naked foliation. There's a natural structure going ha that exists along the leaves of the foliation. See, I told you that we had a mapping here that is a solution to the differential equation. So I can, probably, I can look at the inverse of this mapping that will be defined in the neighborhood of some point within the leaf, not within the ambient manifold, but within the leaf of the foliation. And this will give you a map into C, into the complex numbers. And when you think of it, the fact of being an autonomous differential equation says that if I have a solution to the differential equation, say phi, and if I shift my, my, my solution by some small complex parameter, I will parameterize the same equation, the same, the same uh, leaf of the solutions. And because of unicity, this is essentially the only way to do it. The only, thing you, the only way you can 
define your differential, modify your solution, the only you can change, your, you can perturb your solution and be within the same lift is by having a translation in time. So in other words, when I have the, my leaf or my foliation, let me just draw it like a, like a leaf. It's a two-dimensional real surface, a complex one-dimensional one. What I have is charts taking place in C, such that when I have two different charts that are inverses of solutions, they will be linked by a translation. Okay, so we have these leaves that the solutions of our differential equation are naturally equipped with a translation structure. They have coordinate charts into C, and the changes of coordinates are given by translations of C. So this is one of the three geometries that we have in C. We have translation. This is the group of maps of the form. Okay, so trans just translations by complex numbers. C is a complex number. We have also, we have three geometries, in, three complex geometry, geometries. We have also the geometry of affine maps. And we have projective geometry, one-dimensional projective geometry, the geometry of the group of Möbius transformations, homography. And uh, these are the complex geometries. These are the complex groups acting holomorphically, transitively on a curve. And we have our, our favorite real geometries all fall, fall within these geometries. So here in projective, we have spherical and hyperbolic geometry. And here, within the fine, we have Euclidean and so long. So complex differential equations sit within this geometry, translation geometry, and in fact are equivalent to it. If you have a complex curve and it has charts taking values in C and changes of coordinates given by translations, you can just pull back your vector field, d over dc, dz over c, and since this vector field is invariant by translations, you will get a vector field in your complex curve. Okay? So the geometry of vector fields is the geometry of translations. You can also think of affine uh, one-dimensional complex geometry as related to, to, uh, to vector fields. If you have, so what is, in a, so here you will have charts taken values in C with changes of coordinates given by affine maps. And the fact is that affine maps, or well, the translational part will preserve this vector field, and the uh, homotetic part will change it up to a constant multiple. So if you have some, ch some uh, charts for a curve, and uh, you put in each chart a vector field such that the difference between one and the neighboring one, two charts, the ratio is a constant, then you have an affine structure. It's another way to say it. Okay, so we'll come back to that later. Okay, so. Um, what? The vector field is not zero, then uh, yes, you have, you have this. Then you have the structure, and if the vector field is zero, then what you have is just some, some constant solutions I, I won't be saying anything about, about these. And it may be very complicated. And of course, there's, there's uh, so the good thing is that there's some problems that are interesting to people studying differential equations that can be phrased just in terms of this geometric structure. There are other ones like the dynamics or everything that not, cannot be directly read, but the two are not unrelated. Okay, so let me just let me cite one of these properties. So one property that a geometric structure can have is that of completeness. So here I'm in the context of G, G, GX structures like those. We have uh, we have some space and a group acting on that space. 
and we can take charts in the space X with changes of coordinates within the group G. I'll probably change this vector field to Z. So, okay. so one property of a structure is completeness, and completeness means that your manifold is just a quotient of your model under some group of transformations. Okay, so you can have complete um, translation structures, for example, on, on um, tori, when you quotient by two really two independent translations, and this is completeness. And uh, what does it mean for such a structure coming from a vector field to be complete? Well, it means that there's some solution. So this is in vector fields. This means that if you have your manifold M with your vector field, there is some solution that will be parameterized by holomorphically by uh, C, all of C. You have a global, globally defined solution. Sometimes we call this an entire solution. Okay, so entire solutions are in correspondence with those leaves that carry a complete structure in this sense. Okay, so uh, there's some theorems concerning entire solutions of vector fields. Let me cite, quote, the first one is by Malmquist in 1913, more than 100 years old. And it says the following. It deals with algebraic differential equations. Suppose you have some function, W of t, and suppose that the derivative with respect to t, this is a, com a holomorphic function, satisfies this differential equation. It's just some rational function, p and q, will be polynomials of W and T. And suppose that you have a function, so, uh, you have a differential equation of this form and a solution that is not algebraic, whose graph is not within an algebraic curve. Then the theorem of Malkwist says that, in fact, your equation is, in fact, a Riccati equation. This means that it has a form uh, w squared times some function of t plus w to c of t. So you have, from the fact that you have one entire solution, so this is entire, You have an entire, if you have an entire solution, if you have in such a differential equation one leaf that carries a complete structure, then you know a lot about the differential equation. What? Donde? Si, no, pero. So if you have this differential equation, if you have the solution is an entire one and it's not algebraic, then you, the ratio of your, your, your rational function is, is of this form, and this is a Riccati equation. And there's another theorem. There's many theorems. There's theorems by Yosida and uh, Malmquist and um, Il Polene and uh, many other people. But let me just jump 100 years in time and quote this theorem by Marco Brunella. It says the following, suppose you have a differential equation of this form. Again, P and Q polynomial. And imagine that all of the solutions are, com are entire. That all of the solutions, all of the leaves of defoliation have a complete structure in this sense. Then, this is called a complete vector field. And then what Brunella gives is a classification of these such things. These are very rare. In general, you will not find this. These are very, very rare. And if, every, if all the solutions are complete, then Brunella gives a classification up to a polynomial automorphism. And in fact, um, an important part of this classification is that in fact, you have some variables, you have some, some function of Z and W 
that satisfies a differential equation autonomously. Okay, so let me put it like this. There's, there exists some function, some algebraic function that is this like this, or you can see that if you project onto the y variable, then what you have is that in your, man, in your surface here, C2, you would have some projection that is uh, that your differential equation, your vector field, your flow, will preserve some vibration given by the fibers of this y. Yes? What? Why is it function two variables? Why is that just like that? Yes, it's uh, Z and W. Why, why you, have, you have some projection into a curve this called. Is what, derivative of y. Which variable do you look for? With time, because this is Y of T. Oh, oh, they're, they're both functions of T. Yeah, they're both functions of T, <laughs> then you can derive. Okay, so, so this is uh, a theorem by Brunella, and then a complement to this theorem by, well, it's more than a complement, by. Bustin, Dewey, and Giraldo, and I think this is 2013, says that it's, up, it's, it's sufficient to have um, Brunella's theorem for one leaf to be complete. So if you, in a, if in a polynomial vector field like this, you have a complete a leaf such that its translation structure is complete, then you have a structure theorem like this. You, can, you have a vibration like this. Okay, so that's for completeness. That's an interesting. Uh, is this a local pair or a global? What? Is this a local pair? No, no, no. It's a global one. It's very important that these are polynomial. I, I, I said it, but I didn't write it. And it's, very, it's, it's about completeness of solutions. You have to look at the whole solution. This is not something that you can grasp locally. You know, like we want entire solutions complete. Complete. So this is something that happens. It's not local on the on the leaf. It's a, it's a global if property. M compact, then if m is compact and your vector field is holomorphic, then you have the, th the same theorem you have in the real case that any complex vector field will be complete. Uh, any holomorphic vector field in a complex manifold will be complete. But the thing is, there are very very few holomorphic vector fields in compact complex manifolds. So here you have this vector field PQ, and then if you want to compactify it to CP2, like in Roman's lecture, you will find some poles, you have some, the, the, it doesn't have a nice compactification as a holomorphic vector field, as will be have some nice one as a meromorphic vector field. And then you won't be able to say anything. Uh, if the M is CP2, uh, what does the theorem say? If M, this the theorem is not for CP2, it's for polynomial vector fields on C2. So uh, all, every holomorphic vector field in CP2 is linear, and you know everything about linear differential equations. Yeah, so, so the holomorphic case is, is uh, there are very little holomorphic vector fields on complex manifolds, okay? So this is this property, completeness. And there's another property of GX structures, probably put it right here, that's on C2. In C2, if you have a polynomial vector field such that one of the leaves carries a complete translation structure, then what you have is that there is a vibration by a rational function in C2 over a curve. This vibration and such that the vector field, the, the, the flow of the vector field, will preserve this vibration. In other words, there is some variable y, of the, some variable of the original ones that will satisfy a differential equation. You can isolate one variable in terms of differential equations. In geometric terms, you have a, a vibration that's preserved by the flow of the vector field. So you have a structure theorem out of the existence of. Uh, the vibration of starts on C2 plus C? Or? No, the vibration, this is C, and then this is C2. This is where the vector field is, the polynomial vector field is. 
And this is C, also C, C, C. You have some, some uh, or C, B1, it's maybe rational, okay? So that's it, that's, that's um, and all you need is for some leaf to be complete. So there's another notion related to completeness. Let us call it uniformizability. So this notion, in general, for JGX structures means the following. Means that, so the complete ones are quotient of the whole space by the action of some group. The uniformizable ones will be the quotient of some open subset of your space by a group, okay? For example, one example of a uniformizable projective structure will be the Schottky uniformization. No, so example of uniformization. What? Okay, I'm discuss this, this is a general notion for JX structures. This is also a general notion for G, J, G. No, this is, I, I, no, M is um, the manifold that will carry a, a vector field. And here I'm just saying, you take a GX structure. You get one, take one of these. You take G will be one of your groups. X will be one of your spaces. And you have some geometry locally modeled on the space whose change of coordinates are given by the group. And then this notion makes sense. No, the uniformizable ones are those that can be a quotient of some domain of the space by the action of some group. And of course, there's uh, a more general notion. So let me just give you an example of how uniformizable structures may be. These are the Schottky ones. So for projective structures. Okay, so so, so we saw that if you take in this, we, we've been talking about Schottky groups for a while now. So we have these transformations acting on P1, projected transformations. And uh, we know that there will be some limit set here, a Cantor set. And with that, when you remove the Cantor set and you act by this Schottky group, you will get a compact curve, moreover a compact, compact curve endowed with a projective structures since the, chain, the, the group that we, used, that we are using it to act here is a projective one. Okay, so this is not every, and this projective structure is very fragile in the curve. If you fix the structure of the curve and you move a little bit the structure, then it won't be uh, uniformizable. If you move the group, you will find another. If you move the Schottky group, it will remain a Schottky group. It will be, it will give you a, a uniformizable structure on another curve. You will move the curve with the group. But if you just fix the curve and move the projective structure, then it won't be uniformizable uh, in this sense. So, as you see, it's, it's related to some sort of injectivity of some developing map but it's not quite that. It's just being the quotient of an open subset of the model by the group. Okay, and uh, what is the equation? there's no differential equation, it's just uh, uh, I'm illustrating this notion that's valid for all G structures of uniformizability. That, uh, Okay, so uh, so what what's what's the what's the notion what's the what's the notion in this side of the for vector fields? If I have M and I have my vector field Z on M, and if I have a leaf carrying a, a uniformizable translation structure, what what can I say? What what does it mean? So let me discuss a little bit in order to arrive here. Let me discuss a bit more this. Uh, this property of uh, uniformizability. Okay, so 
suppose I in some jig structure in some manifold. And suppose the following. Suppose so So this is some manifold S. Here's the universal cover of S. And I have some developing map for the structure over my model X. OK? So that has some equivariant, uh, just a representation, and some equivariant properties uh, take place. So suppose that in S, I have two different points and a path. Oh, let me say something about this uniformizable thing, uh, structures, is that they can be restricted. If you have a structure, a uniformizable structure on a manifold, then the structure induced in any open subset of the manifold is still uniformizable. Because you're just, if, if your original one was a quotient of some open subset, then a quotient of a smaller subset will, be, will give you your. So you can restrict this, and they will continue to be uniformizable. So if you have a, uniform, a structure in your surface S, and you look at what happens in the neighborhood of a curve that you can lift to the universal cover, if by any chance it happens that the developing map of this curve maps the endpoints to the same place, then it cannot be uniformizable. So if you find such a curve, then you cannot recover S as a quotient of some open subset of the model by the action of some group of translations. And this is because, well, this wants to be the open set that parameterizes up to, uh, after quotient this set. But you see here we have some uh, overlapping, so you won't be able to resolve the parameterization you need, the uniformization you need. And in fact, this is the only obstruction for uniformizability. If you don't find such a pair of points and a curve, then automatically your structure is uniformizable. Okay? So what does it mean here? So I'll do the same. So this is for general. This is for general GX structures. And let me tell you what, what, is, what, is, what happens when you have a vector field in the presence of the vector field for this translation structure. Well, so I'll do the same drawing. Here I am on M with my vector field Z. And I have one leaf that has this, uh, one leaf that has its, its uh, translation structure, and suppose that I can find a path within the leaf, like the one I, I, I described there, and suppose that the developing map maps this band, the endpoints of this band get overlapped. Okay. Well, you know what, we recall that the structure was given by the solutions to the differential equation. So this inverse of the developing map will be parameterizing a solution. So if your, solution, if your structure is not uniformizable, then you will find this curve, and then your solution will necessarily be multi-valued. So the equivalent notion for vector fields, when you have some domain some, that parameterizes, that, that will be the domain omega which parameterizes, which uniformizes your structures, you have, in some sense, a maximal single valued solution. Okay, so uh, completeness 
entire solutions, and uniformizability means no multivalued solutions. Okay? So locally, you have uniqueness of solutions. That's just the fact that you have charts. But this is something about the global geometry of the structure. You cannot see that locally. You need to travel along some distance in order to notice some lack of uniformizability. You're all, locally, you're always uniformizable. Locally, you have the inverses of your choice. This is some global thing that happens. OK? So a question is the following. For algebraic differential equations, for, ve for, for vector fields and manifolds, algebraic vector fields and manifolds, uh, for a uniformizable leaf, what can be said? about, for a uniformized belief, say, omega, a subset of C quotiented by the group, what can be said about omega? So this will be very, very rare. In general, when you have a vector field, it won't be complete. In general, it, none of the leaves will have this uniformizability property. Some very special vector fields will have one leaf which carries a structure that is uniformizable. And we want to know more things about these vector fields. We want to know more things about these differential equations, these algebraic differential equations having single value solutions and about the functions they define. So, so, this is, so what can we say about omega? And there's this notion of the essential boundaries for, for differential equations. So let me talk to you about a family of differential equations that's definitely an algebraic one. It's a variation of some things by uh, Alfen Brioshi, Brioshi you, you pronounce? Brioshi? What is that? Brioski? Brioski, Brioski. Brioski, Shazi, Ramanujan, and some differential equations attached to the names. And then this is just a, this example is just a variation on this. So, we have a differential equation that's a polynomial differential equation in C3 that depends upon a parameter alpha. Alpha takes values in C as well. And there is some, so again, these are very, very special differential equations. This is far from generic. It has a very particular solution. Uh, the solutions of these equations have a very important invariance property that's the following. Suppose you have a solution, local, global, say local solution, x of t, y of t, z of t, and that you find some matrix A, B, C, D on SL to C. So I forgot to say that there. Then you can use this, this element of SL to C to modify your solution in the way that's written over there. And then when you do so, you will find another solution of the same equation. So let me explain you what's happening. OK, so how, how does it change? Well, you can say that first, I multiply y and c by some, by, some, by some factor and x by the square of that factor over there. And then I add something to x. Okay, so when you look at it in C3, you get the following. You have some, so if you look at this, these changes of coordinates, these this modifications, you see that the ratio of y over z 
is unchanged. That is the image, as functions, the image y over c is unchanged. So if you project onto y over z, you're in, in P1. And the, you have some hyperplanes in C3. Let me just draw one. Above each one of these points, we will have some hyperplane. I'll draw it like this. And the thing is that in almost everywhere, this pencil of hyperplanes will be transverse to the solutions of the equation. So there's a whole family here. So you have your solutions of the equation. And you can read this formula in the following way. If, so remember we have plenty of other hyperplanes, two planes here. So these hyperplanes allow us to identify one solution to another just by pushing along the same hyperplane every point. What this formula says us is that if we want to recover the parametrization of these curves as solutions of the equation, we need to modify the parametrization, but we need, that we need to, to modify the parametrization projectively. We are on a vector field here. Every leaf carries a translation structure, but there is no harm in thinking of these translation structures as projective structures. And what this formula says is that under the holonomy of these planes, under the identification that this plane makes, this projective structure is invariant by the holonomy. Okay, this is a very, very particular vector field. Okay, so in particular, this vector field, so this happens almost everywhere, and there will be, there will be four bad points, points where we don't have this transverse picture, but outside of these points, what I just told you that there's some natural projective structure in the space of leaves of this function tells you that we have some projective structure naturally attached to each alpha. So we fix alpha, you have this drawing, and this alpha will give you a projective structure in P1 with four mark, mark points that will depend upon alpha. And in fact, it's related to the solutions of the equation because if I take a local solution, see if this is C, and I have a solution of my equation taking values in one of these curves, and then if I project, then the inverse will be a chart of this projective structure. And this is all in that formula, see? Okay? So let me tell you what flavors of projective structures we get as alpha varies. Okay, so we have a projective structure, and I'm describing just this very, very particular uh, family of equations, which will uh, not answer the question, but at least show us the kind of uh, what's in the zoo. Will tell us what what, that's, what what are the things that we can find. Okay, so, so we, we'll have a projective structure that depends upon alpha in the sphere minus four points. And in the four points, we will have some parabolic structure. This will look like uh, the quotient of some uh, half plane by a translation locally. So we will have parabolic, the structure will be parabolic in this, uh, the structure will be parabolic. And that's the only restriction for the projective structure we will find. We will find every projective structure in this, in actually this, uh, in the sphere, this is a harmonic four punctured sphere. And we will find every projective structure in it such that the structure on the ends has this parabolic property. This is a vector space of dimension one. So let me draw this parameter plane, this alpha plane. And there's some point that's alpha equals zero where what we will have actually here is the uniformization of the four punctured sphere. So for alpha equals zero, 
we will have that this projective structure can be obtained by taking a very symmetric ideal rectangle and then multi reflecting, have some group, and when you mod out by this group, you will find this four punctured sphere. So, in this case, what we find when we look at the differential equation, it says that, in fact, our solution, so I told you, this is our solution. So, th this, this is our chart of, the chart of our, our projective structure. And in fact, well, the inverse will be naturally a developing map for the projective structure. So, if we take the disk, we quotient by the group, we obtain the four puncture sphere. It means that the image of the developing map is this domain, this disk in size C. So, in this case, this domain will be the natural domain of parametrization of the solutions of our equation. Okay? That happens for alpha equals zero. We have a natural boundary for the for the solution of the differential equation, of the algebraic differential equation. So as we start moving alpha, so that happens for alpha equals zero. There's an extra symmetry that allows us to say that this happens. So when we start moving, so when we start moving, we go from, uh, from this group, from our Fuchsian group, to some quasi-Fuchsian group as uh, Carolyn Series explained to us yesterday. We have some quasi-Fuchsian group. So close to alpha equals zero, we have some quasi-Fuchsian group. And then there's some um, set here, some cauliflower, some, that's called the bear advice, whose interior, okay, so I'll just show you the picture. So, so I, I, stole this, I stole this picture from the internet, and so I stole also the following one. So this is the burst slice. So you can have in the center there's alpha equals zero. This is the plane where alpha lives. This is the, alpha, the plane where alpha is. So in the interior of this uh, burst slice, you will find quasi Fuchsian groups, groups like the, like the ones we had here like this one. So in this group, what I'm saying, and, and the same thing happens. So it, since we are the quotient, since, so the group will now act on this domain. It will produce you a four puncture sphere, the same conformal structure but a different projective structure. Again, the inverse of the, so again, this developing map will map onto the domain where the solutions are defined. So for some alpha inside this bare slice, this is the picture. In the purple region, you will find three holomorphic functions, x, y, and z. And if you take the derivatives with respect to, to time, I didn't want to show you this, you will find that they satisfy the algebraic differential equation. And see now the natural boundary is no longer a circle, it's a fractal curve, the boundary of this quasi-Fuchsian, uh, th this quasi-circle. Okay, so this is the burst lights. And uh, yesterday, Caroline Series told, told us about what happens at the boundary. So let me just repeat it or, or, or misquote it uh, briefly. So what you have is you have your quasi-Fuchsian group. You have a four-punctured sphere in the top. At the beginning, you find the same four-punctured sphere up to orientation. As you start moving alpha, on top, the quotient will be the same four-punctured sphere. The lower one will become different, a different four-punctured sphere. Did you? Okay, so, um, so at the end, so what happens in the boundary, there's essentially two things that may happen. So 
one of the curves. So we have some quasi-circle here. So on one side, when you take the quotient, we have the very same four-punctured sphere, the harmonic four-punctured sphere. And on the other side, as we start degenerating, two things may happen. So this is one thing, and this is another thing that may happen, is that we might be, for the hyperbolic structure, we might be uh, pinching one curve. And the other thing that can happen is that this open set starts becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, like the pseudo of uh, uh, scenario we heard about yesterday. And then we may just, this part will just essentially cover up uh, a big set, a set with, whose complement has empty interior. OK, so all of these domains, what I'm saying is, all of these domains appear as domains where the solutions of some algebraic differential equations are defined. We, don't only, we not, do not only have uh, circles as natural boundaries. We have also fractal curves, fractal Jordan curves. And also in the boundary here, we find some nasty sets as boundaries of our sets where the solutions of our algebraic differential equations are defined, or single-valued solutions of algebraic differential equations. Beyond, so beyond this set, beyond this uh, bare slice, we will find multivaluedness of the solutions. So for the differential equation, I, I showed you for the parameters. Uh, this is a set of parameters with single-valued solutions. This is a set of parameters where the translation structures on the leaves will be uniformized. Okay? So this is the only way I know in which we can produce natural boundaries for three-dimensional algebraic differential equations. And I would like to say that this is, in fact, the only way, but I don't know how to prove it. Because. So I, I think this is the only way to do it. If you find a three-dimensional algebraic differential equation and you have some single-valued solution defined in some subset, some subset with whose exterior has interior, say, that it's, it's really there's some natural boundary, then I'm pretty sure the same mechanism is behind. I don't know how to prove it, of course. So I would be telling you that. Uh, but I know that this doesn't happen in dimension two. You really need to go into dimension three in order to have this phenomenon of natural boundaries. So let me just, in my, the, the time is left, let me just cite, quote the theorem that having a scholarly, the fact that uh, there's no natural boundaries for algebraic um, differential equations in dimension two, okay? So, so now what we'll have is the following, suppose let me just begin by stating a theorem. So you have M a compact complex surface, Keller, Z A meromorphic vector field, a vector field having poles. And suppose that in the complement of the locus of poles of M, we have a solution that's uniformizable, but, it, but that is not complete. So suppose that we have some domain, omega, in C, and we have a map that's a solution that goes into M, that's a solution to a differential equation, phi. And suppose that phi does not extend. So this is uh, really a, a uniformization. So suppose it does not extend. You have the uniformization of one leaf, of this translation structure on a leaf. Suppose that phi does not extend to C. Oh, that, that you're not missing anything. 
Okay, so uh, then what you have is the following, is that your surface M fibers over a curve, which is a P1 or an elliptic curve, and this vibration will be invariant by the vector field. The fibers will be as well either P1s or elliptic curves, and the poles of the vector field will actually be here. There will be some, some bad points in the fibers. And uh, say, suppose, suppose, for example, that you have uh, an elliptic curve, a torus here. There will be some special points. And then what will happen is you, you have here, here you have, suppose that you have here a vector field. This vector field allows you in the base, since the vector, this is the conclusion of the theorem, the vector field will pres preserve the fibers, so it will induce one vector field in the base. And the vector field in the base, in this case, will be complete, say, if this is just C over some lattice, a vector field will be the image of this vector field that is translation invariant, and we will have a way to parameterize the torus by the whole C. But the thing is, what will happen here at these points, we will find some impossibility to lift the solution here. Here, the solution will not be, we will, ha will not be holomorphic. We will have some strange thing happenings. And in fact, what will happen is that as we approach this point, we will be accumulating on one of these fibers. Okay. So this is the theorem. Supposing you just have one leaf that's uniformizable, you get a structure theorem like the ones by like one by. Brunella, complemented by Bustin Dui and uh, Giraldo. And uh, it says, in particular, since we will have some vibration over a curve, and since vector fields in curves that are uniform, that induce uniformizable structures are actually complete, the bad points will be just these fibers, but these fibers will appear isolated in the domain where your solutions are defined. So in, have, so in fact, you can conclude from these descriptions that omega is the complement of a countable set. Okay, from the structure theorem, you can, so in particular, this, this, this phenomena that, the phenomena that was, we saw here of, um, essential boundaries does not appear here. Okay, so, uh, so, so this theorem, a uh, very similar theorem, and the proof intersects it a lot. Uh, I proved with uh, Julio Rebello from Toulouse, and uh, we studied the case where all the solutions are uniformizable, and in this version, you only need one solution to be uniformizable for the vector field to, for, for the structure theorem to take place. Okay, so let me just say half a word about the, the proof of this theorem. So the thing, so we have M, our manifold, that's foliated. And there are some leaves that carry some uniformizable structure and some leaves that don't. Suppose you have a leaf that doesn't. So you have one of these paths such that the developing map will, will overlap itself along this path. So this is a path. Let me draw it. This is a path within a leaf whose developing map does this. So here the structure will not be uniformizable. And in fact, if you move this a little bit, if you 
move this curve to a neighboring leaf, you will be able to find another curve in the neighboring leaf that has the same phenomenon. This is robust. You can, you can move it a little bit. It will remain with overlaps. So we'll, you will find some closed set here where the solutions are uniformizable, just as the bear's slice together with its, with its boundary, these sorts of sets may appear here. So, so this is, uh, so we need to understand this closed set. And in fact, you will need to approach the locus of poles of your vector field. Because if you stay away, away from poles, then the same theorem that tells you that a holomorphic vector field in a compact manifold is complete will tell you that if your solution stays away from the locus of poles, then it will be automatically complete. And we are supposing that it isn't. So, so somehow in M, if you have your locus of poles, you will accumulate to the locus of poles. So you, the thing is, what happens in the locus of poles, you don't really know. But it may happen, for example, that your vector field has this form. This is that you have poles along along this curve, and that you can approach this curve by your solutions. And what happens here is that at, at this curve of poles, the parametrization doesn't make sense because it has poles. However, there is some sort of renormalization trick that tells you, don't look at the translation structure. Forget about it. Look at the affine structure. And in fact, the affine structure induced by the translation structure will be defined in the locus of poles. And now we have some nice affine structure in the curve of poles that has to be uniformizable. And is supported by a, by in, in a, in a complex compact curve. We'll have some singularities. But there are very few uniformizable affine structures on compact curve with singularities. Essentially, you will find they are uniformized by the Euclidean triangle groups. and some generalizations of them. And in fact, so you know, you have some information about these special curves of poles. And if you work a little bit harder and, um, and you do the tricks that uh, the, the algebraic setting allows you, you will find that they are actually fibers of a vibration. And this will allow you to conclude the theory. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much.